This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Big stake, an activist investor jumps into GE in order to revive the share price of one of the most widely owned stocks in mutual funds. Deal reached 12 nations, one controversial trade pact, and the impact on the U.S. economy could be massive. Cost of convenience, why you're paying record amounts to withdraw your cash. All of that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report from Monday, October 5th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Glad you could be with us on this Rally Monday. Stocks started the week on a high note. The Dow Jones Industrial Average soared 304 points to 16,776. The Nasdaq was up 73, and the S&P 500 added 35 points, its fifth straight day of gains and its longest win streak of the year. All three of those major barometers are now out of so-called correction territory, meaning they're now less than 10 percent off their most recent highs. Now, one of the reasons for the blue chip surge was General Electric, the widely held company found in many mutual funds and retirement plan offerings as a new big investor. Tryan Fund Management, run by the activist investor Nelson Peltz, has accumulated a $2.5 billion stake in GE, becoming one of the conglomerate's largest shareholders. The fund says GE shares are undervalued. And just look at the stock's performance over the past decade. Shares of GE down about 20%. Well, the S&P 500 has gained a little more than 60%. Today, shares of GE rose more than 5% on word of that try-in stake. Mary Thompson has more on this big investment by a very big and influential investor. In a first for General Electric, the 123-year-old company is targeted by an activist investor in the midst of CEO Jeff Immelt's latest restructuring. He's already doing these major changes. Peltz is gonna pro probably push him right. a little bit further. Peltz is Thank Nelson you. Peltz, a billionaire investor whose Tryon fund has had a hand in restructurings at Wendy's and Heinz. In GE, Peltz's partner Ed Garden says his firm sees value the market hasn't recognized. It's an amazing risk reward. And I think we bought the best industrial business on the planet. Happens to be trading at the cheapest valuation. Despite Immelt's constant tweaking of GE's portfolio, its stock has lagged the broader markets and its dividend remains well below pre-crisis levels. Still, Tryon likes GE's market share in businesses like jet engines and power, its commitment to research and development, and Immelt's latest effort to remake the company by expanding GE's industrial businesses while selling off $200 billion in financial assets. But Tryon wants GE to sell off even more financial assets, take a tougher stance on cost cuts, and use debt to buy back stock. Management has said they're going to return $90 billion of capital to shareholders. I think that number could be 110 to 120, depending on how you capitalize the industrial business going forward. GE says it welcomes the investment and points out Immelt considered putting Peltz on the board back in 2007. And while Tryon says it's not pushing for a board seat or looking to push Immelt out now, that may change. I think they'll execute. If they don't, then all options are on the table. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson. Channing Smith joins us now to discuss what he thinks this will mean for GE stock and the investors who own it. He is co-portfolio manager at Capital Advisors. Channing, welcome. Nice to have you here this evening. Thank you. What do you think of this particular move by, by Nelson Peltz? Well, we would agree. I mean, if you look at GE, we think it's one of the most undervalued stocks in the marketplace today. We think the opportunity is tremendous for this company to take their operating margins from kind of a low teens number to a high teens number. Look, the plan has already been in place. The transformation from a conglomerate to an industrial is underway. I think that Peltz just realized this. If you look at what he's trying to, to change, not much. So if management can continue to execute, this stock price is going to go higher. I think you just answered my question, and that is what would Peltz have Immelt do that Immelt's not already doing, only faster or deeper? Well, and it, you know, it's interesting, Tyler. If you look at what he's doing, he's really supporting management here. The changes that he's making, maybe to the capital structure, are really minor. Um, but look at what GE's done. If you go back and look at their second quarter, they have been executing. If you look at their industrial orders, they were up 8 percent. Aerospace is strong. Power and water is very strong. Healthcare was actually rebounded. Oil and gas, pretty much flatlined, but pretty good performance in a very weak environment. So if management can continue to execute and get rid of these uh, financial assets, take that capital, use it for buybacks and for key acquisitions, 
this stock has, has got more upside potential in the long term. In the near term, we do have some reservations. All right. Well, I, I want to get to those reservations in a moment. But first, you know, um, management has been executing on this plan from Mr. Immelt for some time, and the street hasn't hasn't liked the stock for a long time. Why is it different now? Well, it's just tough. I, you know, I think uh, Emold has, has had his chances and he's missed on some opportunities. But I think what you're seeing right now in the share price is that industrials have been very weak. If you look at that sector, it's been underperforming. A lot of that price stems from global growth concerns. Emerging market demand has been very weak. And so a lot of these industrials are selling off. The difference is, if you look at GE, about 83 percent of their industrial uh, revenue is recurring. So we feel very that there's a very stable income there, very under-levered balance sheet, and a very good dividend yield. So we think GE will probably see a hiccup in this third quarter just because you're going to see pricing come down. But investors should stick with it. We think it's probably in a range of 24 to 28 in the near term. But we do think that uh, if operating margins do increase, they keep executing. This stock is a 30 to 35 stock in 12 to 18 months. Why do you think the stock has not performed for so long? Well, you know, it, it, we were investors uh, back in 07, and, and there's this hangover, I think, from GE Financial. Um, there's still that stigma on the stock, but we think that is finally going away. You're, you're starting to see uh, that that's going to be a, a, a less and less important part of the business. But GE Financial contributed a lot of the company's profits for a long, long time. No, they did. And if you look at the regulations and everything that's happened in the financial industry, Tyler, it's just not as an attractive mm -hmm. industry mm -hmm. as it used mm -hmm. to be. If you look at industrials and if you can execute, this is a very profitable uh, business with very high margins. That's what GE is going after. Huge growth in emerging markets uh, and international growth. Okay. That's where they want to. That's where they want to go. Channing, very quickly, does Mr. Immelt? How long does Mr. Immelt have to execute those changes before Mr. Peltz and his company puts pressure on him to leave? Well, I think if they can continue to execute on their plan, then he has a little bit of life left. If they start to uh, stub their toe, I think that Peltz will probably step in. Look, GE is a tremendous asset, a tremendous brand, okay. uh, and it should have been doing better the last couple of years. Channing Smith with Capital Advisors, thank you very much. Ty? Tryon's Mr. Peltz also went after DuPont, looking to gain seats on the board. He lost that one. But the activist investor didn't do well in that fight earlier this year. And late today, however, the CEO of DuPont announced her retirement. Ellen Coleman plans to step down from her position on October 16th. DuPont director Edward Breen will assume the role of interim CEO. Shares initially rose on the news in after hours trading. A deal on the controversial free trade pact has been reached. The United States and 11 other nations have agreed to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would open new markets to American companies. Michelle Caruso Cabrera explains what that deal might mean for the U.S. economy. In Atlanta today, trade representatives from 12 countries, all of them on either side of the Pacific Ocean, announcing a free trade agreement, which will remove tariffs and barriers on nearly all goods and services between the countries involved. After more than five years of intensive negotiations, we have come to an agreement that will support jobs, drive sustainable growth, foster inclusive development, and promote innovation across the Asia-Pacific region. If the deal is finally ratified, it will cover 40 percent of the world economy. China is not a member of the agreement. With an economy that is still relatively closed, economists think it would be difficult for them to meet the agreed standards. The agreement is controversial because it's been negotiated in secret and final details trickled out during the day. It's one of the reasons why Senator Marco Rubio, who is running for president, said today he wanted to read the agreement before he would decide whether or not to vote for it. Well, we've got to see the details of it. I'm generally very much in favor of free trade. I explain to people all the time it, that the United States cannot get locked out of 95 percent of the world's consumers. I want to look and see how the trade agreement deals with non-tariff barriers to trade. I'm interested in those sorts of things. Uh, but the details of it are what we need to understand. President Obama is likely to get more support from Republicans than Democrats, many of whom complain that free trade agreements don't do enough to protect American jobs and hurt labor rights abroad. U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders, who is running for president, called it a win for Wall Street and big corporations and vowed to do all he could to defeat the agreement. One of the key sticking points was over a new class of drugs called biologics, which are made from living cells, include cancer drugs like Avastin, for example. Currently in the United States, biologics enjoy exclusivity for 12 years before a competitor can make a generic version. Under this agreement, that exclusivity will fall to eight years, maybe as little as five years. 
The Congressional Research Office says it's difficult to measure the economic impact on the United States, but almost all analysis suggest it will add to the U.S. economy, potentially as much as $35 billion annually to U.S. GDP. They acknowledge it could hurt the U.S. manufacturing sector, but could help the U.S. services sector significantly. For Nightly Business Report, Michelle Caruso Cabrera. The services sector expanded at a slower pace in September, lowest level in three months. The report from the Institute for Supply Management suggests that this segment of the economy may not be immune to uncertainty abroad. Despite the decline, the services sector, which includes things like construction, banking, restaurants, has expanded for 68 straight months. No hurry to hike. That's what former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke said today about the timing of the central bank's first interest rate hike in nearly a decade. Bernanke led the Fed during the financial crisis. And earlier today, Steve Leisman spoke to him in a rare interview since leaving his post. Former Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, quiet since he left office about Fed policy, at least in public, waded into the great rate debate today in a live television interview to promote his new book. Bernanke made fairly clear his view. He supports the Fed's current easy monetary policy and would appear to be in no hurry to raise rates. I would just point to the in inflation rate. You know, uh, even if the Fed had no interest whatsoever in growth and, and employment, which of course it does, but it has a 2% inflation target. It needs to get inflation up to that target. And, uh, you know, uh, easy money is justified by the need to get inflation it up was, to the target. As to why the economy is not firing on all cylinders, Bernanke said the lackluster performance is the result of slower productivity growth. Bernanke's new book, Courage to Act, hit the bookstore shelves today. It's a factual, political, and at times emotional recount of the financial crisis and the extraordinary actions taken by the Fed. He defended the Fed's policies, saying they had led to better results for the economy in a slow-growth world. The former Fed chair also recounted some of the more personal recollections, including his most fearful moment of the crisis. The worst moment, I think it won't shock you, was the Lehman weekend and the knowledge that it was going to fail and, and, and the fear and uncertainty that was associated with that. And then the next couple of days as we, you know, had to deal with AIG and talk to Congress. What does that mean, the worst moment for a Fed chair? Does it mean you were worried that the economy was going to Oh, I was blow up. Oh, what, yeah, what I mean? was very worried. I mean, it, it, my my whole background as an academic was about studying the Great Depression, studying financial panics, their effects on the economy, and I saw we were, you know, having the granddaddy of all financial panics about to explode on us, and I thought the consequences would be tremendous. But Bernanke, in the interview and in the book, concedes there were things he could have done differently. Among them, combating critics with more public appearances and explanations of the Fed's controversial crisis policies. It's not a stretch to think Bernanke's title, Courage to Act, is an implicit criticism of other parts of government. He's saying he and the Fed had the courage to act to save the economy, enacting unique policies, but other parts of the government, especially Congress, fell down on the job. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Still ahead, how much are you paying to get your cash from an ATM? Probably more than you'd like. Justice has finalized a record settlement with BP, more than $20 billion, biggest pollution penalty in U.S. history. It covers the 2010 Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Attorney General Loretta Lynch called the settlement a strong and fitting response to the worst environmental disaster in U.S. history. It resolves all federal and state claims against BP for the accident. The new term of the Supreme Court got underway today, and there are some noteworthy cases that could influence the way business gets done in this country. Hampton Pearson has more from our nation's capital. The 2015 Supreme Court term finds big business hoping for favorable decisions from the Roberts Court in two high-profile cases that could curb costly class-action lawsuits. There is a feeling, I think, among some members of the court that the lower federal courts have turned too far in the direction of helping out plaintiffs, and they are, are wanting to cut back on that. The most high-profile case involves Tyson's Foods. 
They're looking for the justices to overturn a $5.8 million judgment because they failed to pay some 3,000 employees at a pork processing plant for the time spent putting on and off protective gear. At issue is just how many of those employees were eligible. In the Tyson case, many of the employees worked nowhere near 40 hours a week, so even if they spent 15 minutes donning and doffing uniforms, they would not have been entitled to overtime pay. Nonetheless, the lower courts lumped all of the Tyson employees into one big group. Another case involves the internet search engine Spokio. It's being sued by a Virginia man for publishing inaccurate information. The individual admits there was no harm, but he still wants to preserve his right to sue. Mandatory union dues for government workers is at issue in a case involving the California Teachers Association. The union argues they should collect dues from all workers, even those who don't join the union, because all workers benefit from collective bargaining between the unions and government. The issue in this case is whether public employees who opt out of joining a union can be forced to pay dues nonetheless that cover the uh, reasonable uh, costs associated with collective bargaining. In the 1970s, the Supreme Court said that this is fine, but in recent years, in two cases, the justices questioned the validity of this 1970s case. The election year calendar also finds the court dealing with cases involving voting rights, race in college admissions, and religious objections to birth control. The court's decisions on many politically charged issues will come during the heat of the presidential campaign with candidates from both parties already making the future makeup of the court a lightning rod issue in the 2016 election. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court declined to hear an insider trading case, which the Department of Justice had hoped would broaden the definition of that crime. The justices gave no reason for turning it down, but by doing so, they keep in place an appeals court decision making it more difficult to prosecute such cases and possibly undermine a number of convictions. But U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara told CNBC he thinks the decision will affect only a small subset of cases. Twitter today naming co-founder Jack Dorsey as CEO, as expected, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. As we reported last week, there was speculation Dorsey would be named chief of the social media firm. He's been interim CEO since July, that when former chief Dick Costolo left the company. Dorsey will also remain the head of Square, a payments startup he co-founded. Twitter shares up about 7% on the news. They closed the day at 28.15. Spark Therapeutics announced a successful stage 3 gene therapy trial that treats night blindness. The company plans to file for approval from the Food and Drug Administration next year for what could become the first gene therapy treatment in the United States. Shares of the biotech firm soaring today 20 percent. They finished at 5302. And the health technology company Illumina warned investors of lower than expected revenue for the third and fourth quarters. The firm blaming disappointing sales in Europe and weakness in Asia and the Pacific region. That sent shares tumbling in initial after-hours trading as you see it fall off the cliff there. During the regular session, the stock was off just a fraction at 163.17. Activist investor Starboard Value increasing its stake in the security company Brinks. Starboard is already the company's largest shareholder and hopes to turn around Brinks' poor financial performance. Brinks shares popped about 4.5% on the news, ending the day at 29.70. The container store announcing earnings and revenue that missed estimates after the close. This as margins narrowed and expenses increased. Shares were initially lower in after-hours trading, and during the regular session, the stock was up nearly 3 percent to 15.57. And the L.A. Times is reporting that Lionsgate and Stars are in advanced merger talks. That combination would create a major media company. The two companies reportedly held high-level talks for several months. No deal is certain, however. Lionsgate saw its shares pop in initial after-hours trading. During the regular session, it was up more than 1 percent. Stars initially rising after the close. During the regular session, the stock was up 4 percent. Well, you may want to think twice, if you don't already, about using an out-of-network ATM. A Bankrate.com annual survey says the average free fee to withdraw money from an ATM that's not affiliated with your bank will cost you a record $4.52. 
That charge is up 21 percent over five years ago. Greg McBride, senior financial analyst at Bankrate.com, joins us now to talk more about the study. What's going on here, Greg? Is it as simple as they're charging it because they can get away with it? Well, I think that's part of it, Tyler. I think also, too, is the fact that people are getting smarter about how they use their money and how they make these cash withdrawals. People are using less cash, and when they make their withdrawals, increasingly, they're doing so at their own network's ATMs. So there are fewer people going outside the network, and so that cost is being spread over fewer people. I see that's a big contributor to these ever-escalating fees. So in the survey, um, you went to a number of major cities around the country. Let's take a look at the highest average ATM fees. And Atlanta tops the list. Yeah, Atlanta would top the list. New York also is in second place, both of them over $5 on average. Uh, and, and what a lot of people don't realize is when you go outside the network, you're not just paying one fee, you're paying two. You're going to pay your bank, and then you're also going to pay the ATM mm -hmm. owner. These figures reflect the combination of those two fees. So even if your bank says, we won't charge you for going outside the network, doesn't mean it's a free withdrawal because you're also going to have to pay that ATM owner. The cheapest cities are no bargain. San Francisco at 385, Cincinnati at 386. All of the others are over four dollars. But let me ask you this: I don't know that you know the answer to this, Greg. But give me a guess. They're charging four dollars and sixty-five cents an average for this. What is their cost for doing one of these transactions? What's their margin? Well, on the that? cost. Well, you know, the cost to your financial institution is, is probably pretty minimal. They're charging you, you know, $1.50, $2.50. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it's not costing them anywhere near that to process Pennies. that Pennies, transaction. Pennies, right? Pennies. In all likelihood, yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe small coins. Uh, um, um, the ATM owner, on the other hand, uh, you know, I think with the policy there has always been that the bank's own customers get the access to the ATM for free, and so it's the non-customers that pay the freight, uh, and that's one where that's we see it go up year in and year out in, in large part. But even to that, them, those even to them, the cost the must be minimal. I mean, they own uh, Wells Fargo. I'm picking a name. Wells Fargo is uh, charges their customers nothing, but they're charging me, a TD Bank customer, three dollars. Their cost for that transaction is nowhere near three dollars. It's not the cost of the transaction as much as it's the overall upkeep of the network, upgrades for the network. All that cost is being borne by non-customers. So something to keep in mind the next time you're thinking about making an ATM withdrawal, plan ahead so that you can use your own bank's ATM and not have to pay those fees at all. Mm. What can I do? I can avoid all of these, right? Yeah, absolutely. The fees are completely avoidable. So we're not hostage to these higher fees. The first thing is, you know, use your bank's website mm -hmm. or their app and, and find out the location of the nearest in-network ATM. These networks are bigger than ever, so that's easier than ever. If you're in a pinch for cash and you're using your debit card at the point of sale, get cash back yeah. that way. That's tantamount to a, a free withdrawal. And then also consider banks that have broader yeah. ATM access. You know, a lot of community yeah. banks and credit unions belong to large nationwide networks. So you're not necessarily at a disadvantage. Always there. great to see you, Greg. Thank you. Greg McBride, bankrate.com. And according to financial data, financial data firm SNL Financial, the banks with the highest ATM fees are Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, TD Bank, and PNC Bank. Who knew Saturday Night Live had a financial arm? Coming up, planning a trip <laughs> to Disney. You might want to take a close look at your calendar. Yes. Here's a look at what to watch for tomorrow, a report on the trade gap, an important economic indicator. The International Monetary Fund will release its World Economic Outlook ahead of its annual meetings. PepsiCo and Yum! Brands will report earnings, and that is what to watch on Tuesday. Planning a trip to Disney? Well, the cost could soon depend on when you go. The company considering surge pricing. You pay more on peak days, like Saturdays and holidays, less on other times. Julia Borston explains why. It could cost less to go to Disneyland or Disney World in the middle of the week or in the winter, and more on the busiest days of the year. For the first time in the 60 years since Disneyland launched, the Magic Kingdom is considering switching to demand-based pricing. The parks are doing so well and operating at such high capacity at this point that they're trying to 
improve the customer experience by probably redirecting some of the traffic you know, more evenly throughout the year as opposed to having it concentrated in an absolute peak season. And this is the kind of thing they wouldn't be doing if things were going badly. This is the kind of thing I think you do when things are going really well. Disney's been raising prices faster than the rate of inflation over the past several years, but that isn't necessarily enough to deal with massive crowds. Both Disneyland here in California and Walt Disney World in Florida have seen record attendance each of the past three fiscal years, plus the quarter that ended in June. That means if you wanted to visit a park on a holiday, it could cost far more than the $99 it now costs to visit Disneyland and the $105 to visit Disney World. That plus busier parks during the down season could be a big boost to Disney's bottom line. I think over time variable pricing is going to have a positive impact on, on operating income and, and on revenue. I think largely because it will keep the customer experience as positive as possible uh, for each price range. Disneyland Paris has been offering tiered pricing since last year, with prices ranging from $64 for the low season to $94 for a ticket for any time of year. Disney tells me there's no official plan to launch variable pricing here in the U.S. yet. It's just something that they're exploring internally and talking to visitors to see how they feel about it. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. And that does it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. We'll see you tomorrow.